I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. I won't say there's something special about being there when somebody is convicted of murder, but it is an extraordinary moment and so much tension usually goes before it and waiting for the jury to come back in. The victim's family were there, Nora Sheehan's sons were there. And of course, No Long was sitting in the dock, a man who has got away with murder for more than 40 years and many other crimes besides. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time really um, anything serious has kind of not, you know, has basically gone against him. So what was it like? It was intense. Mm. And emotional. Mm. I didn't know if I was going to get through it without crying, to be honest with you, because I thought I need to be impartial. I'm a journalist, but there's always a human element to it as well. Um, you know, for the first time today, I've seen a crack. Um, I've seen little cracks in No Long. He was kind of sat there for the majority of the trial, stony faced, unreadable, couldn't really tell much. But today we saw tears. Um, Actual tears. Feel, yeah, feeling sorry for himself. Yeah. Not his victim, no. not the victim's family. Um, there was tears from him. There was a lot of tears and emotion from Nora Sheen's family who have waited 42 years. I can't even imagine mm. what that's like um, to go through losing somebody in such a manner and then have to wait so long and they're hanging over you for years and years. And and, and as they, and they said in their victim impact statement, no longer to live his life for the past 42 years. Theirs has been, you know, tarnished and with sadness and grief and it's affected generations of that family. Murder just has the most horrendous effect on generations and generations. You know, she has grandchildren who never knew her. Yeah. Um, Her own children grew up without a mother and with that whole dark cloud over her death and how she was found. Just to remind people how Nora Sheehan was found because it was as undignified an end for any woman, as you can imagine, and it was no long who the court today, the jury decided, had not only killed her, but had left her in that fashion. She was sprawled naked in a ditch at the side of the road, her dress pulled up uh, as if to try and, you know, yank it off her head, but it had got stuck because the zip was still closed. Her tights were down around one ankle and uh, she had been left there for some days, um, the prosecution believe, and her body and her remains had been, you know, left in the, uh, had been exposed and there had been animal activity and all the rest of it. And so awful was, you know, where she she lay in, in a Shannon at a place called the Viewing Point in 20 miles from Cork City, that the um, initial thought of those who found her was that it was she, she was actually a dead animal. Yeah. It took them a few minutes to realise that this was a human being that had been left like that. I mean, it's it really is a, a shocking case. And if you think as well that no long lived in that community straight after, was back there and has been in or around People, they, the Nora Sheen's family would have heard of him, would have known all of his movements, would have known that he was getting on with his life, mm. started relationships. You know, it, that, that, that I think is a thing that families find really, really difficult. Um, the visibility of that person mm. and the probably the insistence that, that, that he, they're innocent and possibly even gone around talking about it, you know. It's a particularly peculiar case, Claude, isn't it? Because actually No Long was charged with this murder in 1981. This murder was solved pretty much immediately. Yeah. He was a known sex offender living in the area. He was stopped in his car some days after she, her body was found and the car was examined and it became apparent fairly quickly that she had been in the car. Yeah. So his car was stopped a couple of days after the body had been found and I'm going to say the reasons. Yeah. You can say, you can say anything you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And le- you can leave that in. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Let me tell people listening. Yeah. We have been so cautious been so for cautious. the last yeah. few weeks because before anybody who's listening to myself and Niall talking about the Regency Hotel and joking along as yeah. we did and commenting on what we thought of everybody that gave evidence, that was before three judges in the Special Criminal Court. This has been a trial by jury and it's really important for the media never to stray outside what is heard in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. And that includes we cannot report on 
legal argument and this case went into legal argument quite a few times. Yeah. And when you come out of a day in court and you kind of can get a little bit panicky, was that bit said in legal argument or was it said in open court? So today, Claudia, you can say exactly what uh, you and want. Of, and of course, we've known of Noel's. Yeah. It's not the first time this this last few weeks that Noel Long has been in the Sunday world. We've known of his history as a sex offender, as a as a criminal, a, mm. a serious criminal, um, you know, being involved in burglaries and, and sex attacks. I was and forced to apologise to him, but I'll get to that later. So, yeah. so I mean, the long grass. But none of that could be come out during a trial no. because he goes in as an innocent man, as a seventy-two-year-old, no long, and that's it. Yeah, you, you know, we wouldn't report. He looks as even how he looked or how he reacted. But of course, that's now he's not a suspect anymore. He's a proven murderer. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. He's given a life sentence, and his past is is gives a, a pathway to what did happen that night. Yeah. So like, that's why I was kind of stepping back because yeah. it wasn't said in legal argument, but we knew the reason why he was pulled over that night. So we just were told that it was uh, in relation to another matter, but we know that it was um, in connection with a post office robbery and he has four convictions for burglary. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he was pulled over in connection with that burglary, um, was driven with the guard from the technical bureau to the Garda station where they took in the car and started sweeping it for evidence. And that is where they got this debris. And of course they knew him as a as a local sex offender. So they were able to take them bits of debris from the car. Now they never said where in the car the, the debris was taken from. They did say there was paint from the boot mm -hmm. but that again there could have been the same paint on, paint on the boot could have been on the side of the car. I'm not sure exactly whether it was a fleck of paint from a can inside the boot or a fleck of paint from the car itself on the boot. So so that would indicate maybe where she was, but we, we, we're not sure. So if you go back to his first real serious conviction, as far as we know, is is in uh, 1972. Was that what, what was said in court? I think it was back to the 60s. That, yeah, the which, first so he one was, he has is 66. He was certainly a suspect in this case from the beginning because, yeah. the, you know, it was very clear that Nora Sheehan had been sexually assaulted, likely raped and her body dumped and she they, they didn't ever believe from the beginning that that it was at Chip Paul Woods where she was found that it had happened. No long had previous history of picking up vulnerable women mm -hmm. yeah. and bringing them to derelict homes where he, you know, would then rape. There was a different word on that. We'll come to that. But we want to just concentrate for the moment on the fact that no long was the suspect from the beginning and he was put on trial. Yes. So he was he was arrested and he was in custody for two weeks until he was granted bail. Um, and that was in July of 81. So a month later, however, a month again after that, the pathologist suddenly died. The, the Dr. Coakley, who we've spoken about, who did the original postmortem on Noah Sheehan's body, he died. And at the time... Um, the DPP directed for the murder charge to be withdrawn because obviously they thought that that, you know, the cause of death and the, the details we got in the post-mortem were so significant to this case. But also back then, we spoke about this as well, where this law came into place in the Criminal Act in 1992 that meant... Um, evidence from a deceased person could be used in a criminal trial, whereas they didn't have that then. So even if they did go ahead, okay. they wouldn't and have been able to introduce the that was the reason, because I, I, yeah. I was thinking, gosh, how unusual to collapse the whole case because somebody else, you know, nowadays it seems so normal that another expert can come in and read the notes, but that didn't exist and that's what changed in 92. That's and what then changed. obviously when the cold case unit was established in the mid noughties, it was one of the cases that they realised that looked they could at, yeah. Yeah. probably solve, which is what kind of brought them onto our radar. But to go back to that, um, he's in custody for two weeks. So the whole community know he is the suspect and he's charged and brought to court. And wasn't he brought to court? Did the trial start? The trial didn't start, no. Um, but he was brought to court to be told that the charges were being dropped. I actually, I, I'm not yeah. sure. I would assume so. I assume he'd be taken into court to be given that information. Um, it just, we just heard that the DPP withdrew yeah. the charges. Um, like what a stroke of luck for no long. Yeah. I mean, um, what a stroke of luck for no long. Yeah. And I mean, it must have looked, must have looked like it was going to hold all through those years as well, you know. And it did hold. It did yeah. hold. I mean, that's, there's not many killers out there who literally go to the door of a courtroom and then the death of somebody on the case means that they walk free. Yeah, I don't think it's something that, we, again, like you said, that we would see nowadays because of that yeah. Criminal Evidence Act, but also the fact that, you know, 
this is such an old case. Like mm. we keep saying it, it was 42 years old. There's so many people that were, had given evidence, um, had given statements, etc. that their evidence wasn't brought to the court, not not under that criminal act from 1992 because it could have been brought in but we just didn't hear from eyewitnesses and mm-hmm. um, there was a couple who we heard about um his next door neighbors who had seen him that night at 11 38 walking his dog but the defense ended up saying you know the prosecution was like i'm f- we're fine with that evidence being yeah. brought in if you want to give it to the jury that's fine but the defense said no they didn't want that in um and we also heard from yeah. um donald boyle who was a friend of his, who we heard in legal argument had actually only come forward very recently to change the statement that he originally gave to the police. So the statement he gave back in 81 was that he met with No Long that evening beforehand on the on the, on the the 6th. They were due to meet on the morning of the 7th to go for a dive um, and No Long showed up late, but the dive didn't go ahead because of the weather. Mm-hmm. He was interviewed again in 2021 uh, by this, uh, the the special crime review, the serious crime review team. Don't know what that statement was. However, the Saturday, this trial went, this went to trial on the Thursday and on the Saturday. So three weeks ago yesterday, it went to trial. On that Saturday, then he came forward again to Gardy and said, I want to give a statement. He said that he had been blinded by loyalty to no long um, and he felt sorry for the family of Maura Sheehan and he wanted to finally come forward with the truth. The truth being that, he was meant to meet Noel Long the next day for a dive. They waited until two o'clock for him to show up and he didn't. Mm. So he went back and changed his 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 statement. But the um it wasn't accepted into evidence. And again in an so unusual way, quick. that alibi wasn't what stopped him being no. convicted of murder all these years. I mean, that alibi was part of a case that was never heard because of that DPP's decision back in nineteen eighty one. Um but nonetheless it does show and I think one of the backbones of these cold cases is the belief that loyalties change over the years, that people are in totally different situations, you know, 20, 30 years on, that they may be no longer afraid, that they may no no longer be in a relationship with an individual. And that's kind of like why they they go back out and they re-interview everybody because, you know. And why they go and make these appeals again. Exactly. We've seen that again in recent weeks. Time and time again, Yeah. yeah, yeah. So as I said to you there, behind the scenes during this court case and the public won't be aware of this, but there was a number of attempts. There was a lot of legal argument and that legal argument was all centred on the defence's attempts to have the trial collapse. Yes. So there was one, I think a week or two ago on the Monday we went in and I think it was when the final bit of evidence was as was the case was rested by the de, the, the prosecution, the defence uh, put it through a motion to have the, the case thrown out because they believed that there was um, they didn't prove the intent for murder. Um, or sorry, no, they originally what they said was they wanted the case thrown out because the age of it. Um, it was there was culpable delay by many different people, like between um, you know, the age the how long it took for it to get mm-hmm. to trial because they Nothing was Statues done. Statues of limitations, they call that, that they were trying to prove that this was too long. Yeah, so they were trying to say that, you know, well, if the evidence came, if that evidence act came in in, in 1992, why didn't you do something then? Okay. When the cold case review team um, had the case for a number of years, what took them so long? The case went back to Cork for a number of years. What took them so long? Mm-hmm. And it was only when the case went back to Cork that they were able to actually solve it and, and get their prosecution. So that was their first... Um, attempt to try and have yeah, the Because the people case have, uh, they have a right to hear, uh, be heard in a timely manner. Yeah. And there was obviously delays, even even when the, the test, the DNA was testing was done, it still took a, a number of a number of years to come to come to trial. But of course there is no statute of limitations on murder mm-hmm. in Ireland. Yeah. And and it's as simple as that. Mm. And like that was four days the jury were away for that yeah. we were listening to legal yeah. argument for two of those and then it took the judge a day a day and a half or so to, you know, um come to his conclusions about mm-hmm. uh, you know, rule on 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 the motion. Um then also there was their second attempt was after Dr. Cassidy gave the evidence, her evidence, they tried to say that there was no intent uh, to kill was provable by the state. And that was their second attempt to have the case pulled. And that was because though the, the original report um, recognised these injuries, but there was no actual cause of death on it. Mm. Um, and she was asked for her opinion on it. And her opinion was that she couldn't actually establish the cause of death. Yeah. But she was pointing to the fact that 
you know, it was clearly some sort of a strangulation or a compression on the neck that could have happened if her face was pushed into a, a pillow or something soft like that. And it was probably over the course of a sexual assault that yeah. she died. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it wouldn't. So it's murder convictions have been achieved in the state before without a clear cause of death. Um, you know, Grain Dwyer probably would be the most yeah. famous where, you know, the, his victim's body was found a, a long time after the murder occurred and um, too long for it to be proven exactly why the woman died. And um, so that is not an automatic bar to say that, that, you know, because it can't be nailed down specifically if a body isn't found. The difficulty the for day, the prosecution. It though. is a difficulty that they have to get over. Big time. But they I had. Mean, in the Graham Dwyer case, it was like Elaine O'Hara's body was found up in the Dublin mountains and um, like there was some of it, you know, they didn't retrieve all of her remains. No. And in particular, you know, it was suspected that he had choked her yeah. to death or strangled her to death, but there was no remains around yeah. the throat area. They mm. were gone. They never they And that never was another them. thing as well. Um, her larynx was missing as well, mm. nor she. And so that had gone missing after the post, the f- first postmortem. So that she couldn't even, Dr. Cassidy didn't even have, you know, that to... To review judge. or yeah. to judge and I mean I'm not sure what you can see from that but I'm sure you know that was part of their Similar difficulty. I think to the Elaine O'Hara case that that was more than likely missing when the remains were discovered mm. and they talk about I mean this is look awful for victims families but the fact of the matter is you lay a body in a field and there's all sorts of animals and, and you know the, the body disintegrates at the best of times but you know what what can be what can be missing could be the key to mm. the cause of death. In some cases, you'll see like some of the organs have either been missing or an organ would show. However, the, the prosecution still made the case, the, the, the circumstantial case, that there was the inescapable conclusion from all of the bits of evidence, including the the the, the evidence of assault, including the evidence of a sexual assault, that, you know, the, the location of the body, the fact all of these things can be put together in a circumstantial case to prove that murder did occur. Mm-hmm. And then they it's have to... a pretty clear-cut case, wasn't it? I mean, we were talking, obviously not on the microphones, but afterwards, I mean, the fact of the matter is this woman had been, she was described as vulnerable. She seems to have had some sort of an accident and had a tendency to flag down cars and maybe get in for a lift and discuss with people. She was a pre, she'd previously worked in a hospital and she'd talk about sort of rambling really about the hospital. Um, now, she was a mother of three, married woman and fully functioning otherwise, but just this little vulnerability. Yeah, here. possibly a brain injury. We Something don't know. like that. Yeah. We talked about a fall in a hospital. Yeah. Um, I suppose back then people didn't actually probably properly examine this. No, or have to. to. Say yeah. People had a little vulnerability yeah. and that's how she was. Um, so she had been seen out on the road and doing this kind of flagging down cars. Uh, it was known that it was all based on forensics, really, this case. It was known that that she was in his car. Yeah. And Pretty he, clear that she hadn't wandered off and left herself in this position in a field. Yeah. In, in the condition she was in. And obviously pretty clear that they had had some sort of a sexual encounter his sperm was found in her vagina. Yeah, and there was an assault as well. Clear there was, that there was an assault. Exactly. Clear he was in the area due to even the witness that you spoke about. Mm. And so, do you know, for me, but you never know with a jury you know, because they don't know all the background. Yeah. We're always coming at these cases. You'd be sitting in a courtroom and you're looking at the suspect and you're going, he's guilty of sin <laughs> and you know he's guilty. But the jury don't know no. this and they don't know all the bits that we know. So sometimes you can be surprised by a jury's verdict. Yeah. But I was quite confident all the way through, I have to say, that he was going to get done with murder. Mm. I just thought it was really obvious that, OK, you might not know the exact cause of death, but she was alive. Uh, she was in his car. There'd been some sort of a sexual encounter and she was left in the in the way she was. Yeah. That, you know, come on, what else could have happened? Yeah, like the, the defence did suggest to the jury that he would have a motive to dump her body in that manner. Well, in, in dump a body if she had suffered a heart attack and died of mm. shock or something like that. Um, That's to leave her grasping at straws. It is, but to leave her in that manner, yeah. you know, um, not that I could understand if somebody had a heart attack, you panic and you exactly. hide the body, but you don't see that happen where somebody hides a body and they're left in that kind of yeah. sexual pose. Um, but also, you know, the jury were told, he, he, 
as you are going off to consider your verdict, he is entitled to the presumption of innocence. Right now he is innocent. You have to presume he's innocent and you should work from there. But like yesterday when we heard that they were looking for diagrams of the injuries, you know, I kind of in my head, I thought they're probably debating it out whether it's manslaughter or murder I was like there's no way they're going to come back with not guilty mm. um, from all the evidence we've had it's one, it's definitely one or the other and I was kind of panicking I was like oh gosh are they going to come back with manslaughter because again in my heart yeah. you see these things you're kind of I suppose maybe we are read a lot about stuff like this or talk about a lot of stuff like this and we kind of know that whereas the jury might not yeah no um, and sometimes it can happen in court cases that people juries feel well you know he did something, but we're not we're not going to go for a full murder charge. You and know of course, what I mean? they're all individuals, so you could they have are. two on it. They go, well, hang on a second, yeah. we've no cause There's a doubt. doubt, yeah. And then if there's two, and then they, uh, and everyone agrees, well, he definitely killed her, so let's go manslaughter. Yeah. Now, having said that, even if they got manslaughter, while that would have been slightly disappointing, I'm sure, for the family, and for, let's say, also some members of his family, because his family, members of his family, have not supported him over the years. In actual fact, they've been very vocal about the danger he is to society. Um, but that would have, look, there would have been a hefty sentence, you'd have imagined, even if he got manslaughter. Yeah. It can be up to life. It can be. And, and you'd probably have seen a 14 year or more. There. Yeah, of course, mm. with those convictions, the which are very, very everything. serious convictions. Um, yeah. We talk about them. So, and again, the jury don't know any of this. They don't know he's all these previous convictions, but they were read out in No, the they end. were read out. So the jury were invited actually to come back for the sentencing. So it was the first time they were hearing this. And I was trying to, you know, gauge from them whether they're surprised or not, but they were kind of, again, just, they didn't yeah. really give away too much. Um, but yeah, we, we heard that he has 31 previous convictions, 27 here in Ireland and four in the UK. Um, six of those are for common assault, three for public disorder, four for burglary. Um, he has a sexual assault um, charge. He has substantial road traffic convictions. He has another one from assault causing harm. When Nora Sheehan was murdered, he was married and had kids. And he's been with his current partner for the past 25 years. He's been in there in court with him. Um, like this, he is an extremely dangerous Man, extremely. I mean, he's been described to us as mm -hmm. violent, mm. as serious as so, sex offender yeah. at, the, at the very least. And um, we know he certainly has been a person of interest in other murders. Um, but like no long didn't come from a dysfunctional family. He no. came from an extremely stable home, um, a very supportive family, both parents, you know, working hard workers. Um, honest people, yes. no criminal history whatsoever. He was from a big supportive family and is the only one that ended up on the wrong side. Ended up on the wrong side of the law. But a bully. He's a biker. He's a diver. There is two major hobbies: mm. Harley Davidson bike rider and big into this diving round, the kind of the the cork deep sea diving. Yeah. Right. Um, he's a bully. He was a bully in the home, in his family home, and a bully outside of it. He was married at the time that Nora Sheehan uh, went missing and was murdered. And he had two children um, with his partner who stood by him afterwards, his wife. She stayed with him. She didn't drop him after he was charged with murder. And then it was uh, he avoided that trial because of uh, the death of an investigator. Um, and... You know, we we know he he was involved in a number of other serious sexual assaults, which we will deal with maybe in the Sunday world. We'll do some something up in the Sunday world, yeah. and we'll, we'll come back to it also next week and talk about it some more. Um, but when the cold case unit started up in two thousand and eight, I think it was or thereabouts, they identified two hundred unsolved murder cases in Ireland, and. They couldn't just go at them all because to re-investigate these cases takes months and months and months. So they had to kind of uh, divvy them up into the ones most likely being solved. And No Long's case was one of them that was put into a possibility list. Um, and they started investigating him now. I think that was back around 2010-ish. Yeah. Uh, they first started, or certainly he was on a list to... Um, to be reinvestigated. And there was only a handful of the detectives, like they were on so many cases and they were each given files to reread over, huge amount of research to be done. But nonetheless, 
Um, around that time, I knew certainly No Long was one of the, and Nora Sheen's murder case was one of the ones that they were hoping to revisit. Um, and I ended up doing a bit of a story on it and went down. And he was living with that partner at the time mm. in Passage East? Passage West. Passage West. Okay. Yeah. Passage East is in Wexford, is it? I don't know. I don't know. Or, is I've there a Passage East? <laughs> Passage West, Google anyway. After. And I can still see the house. And he had pulled, they'd pulled in with their shopping. We had done a bit of a story on a bit of background. Um, and I approached him to ask him, had he anything to say about Nora Sheehan's murder? Did he realise he was the chief and only suspect in it? And uh, his partner at the time told me I had some cheek yeah. to ask those questions. I was like, hi on me. <laughs> You're living with this guy. Yeah. Um, and he was, there was a gate closed between us and I was actually very glad of that. And I also had a quite a big burly chap with me. Right. But he was aggressive, aggressive. I mean, there was absolutely, I could just see him looking for a way to get at me and he couldn't because it was a gate between us. And it was a very quick uh, sort of doorstep. And one of those ones that in hindsight was a dangerous one to do because he's yeah. a very volatile mm. character. He has a huge distaste for women. He's a problem with women and um, he has repeatedly gone for vulnerable women. But at the time of writing the story, yeah. I made one little mistake Yeah, in that I said he had been convicted, he had a history of sexual assault on vulnerable women. And I said that at the time of the murder of Nora Sheehan, he had two convictions for rape and assault. But, and, and one of those related to he he um, lured a special needs girl into his car, brought her to a derelict house in Crosshaven and absolutely terrified her uh, with this sexual attack. So he wrote to the press ombudsman yep. and made a big, long complaint about me because he wasn't convicted of rape. Yeah. He was convicted of? Intent. Intent. To ravage. To ravage, which was a charge that existed back in 72, 72 when that happened yeah. and it had it had changed name to rape which, which they constantly do like I mean nearly all yeah. of those charges are, are are have been called different names there's you know particularly the underage uh, sexual charges they're all known by different names and they mm. constantly get updated and the sentencing provisions like that's long gone I've never heard of that charge again and not to go into too much detail about it but basically it was an attempt it was a very it was, yeah. He, he, anyway, I can't go into the detail because it's a little bit too crude, but it all related to that older charge that was updated. Mm. Um, but anyway, he made the complaint and uh, I was forced to apologise to him. Yeah. I've never been so sickened in all my but life. But you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a particular type of person that launches those, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those complaints to the, to the ombudsman because... Like if if somebody apologizes, I'm sorry for calling you a, a rapist. rapist. You you're just it. you're just a, a sex attacker. You're a ravager. Like it doesn't. You don't obviously win any money, and and you mm. know, does your reputation get enhanced by people now know I'm just a sex attacker rather than a rapist? Or yeah, you know. So, but there is a type of person. or that the, the yeah. name of the charge changed. Does yeah. your reputation? Yeah. Does it help your reputation? Well, no. I don't think it just so. highlights it all again. It does. It, but there is a type of person that that can persist in these sort of complaints. Uh, you know, we have had many of them in different countries and everything. I mean, you know, a certain type of person, uh, often people with sex offence convictions that are serial complainants as well mm. about these little things. I mean, I remember we got a, I mean, the most ludicrous legal letter we ever got was we had rewritten a story in the British uh newspapers about Rolf Harris, who was a serial sex offender as well. I know people kind of a children's entertainer and he had written, we had included a bit rewritten from an English newspaper that he was keeping, uh, keeping other prisoners awake by playing his didgeridoo <laughs> at night in prison. He complained about that. He complained about that, hired a solicitor's firm and sent it around. I um, do not play my didgeridoo at night. No, I don't play my didgeridoo <laughs> in my prison <laughs> cell at night. Mental. And despite the fact to have all these sex Other things, frictions, yeah. this is damaging to my reputation. But yeah. it sounds but like a story from the Onion or Warford It sounds like a story from the Onion, but it's not, I don't think yeah. it's about that. It's about this kind of... Um, no, it's about yeah. getting back at you. I mean, I definitely, in his case, I think it was because I was a woman. Yeah. And because I had sort of exposed him for the fr first time, we had... 
double crossed him in a way in order to get his photograph and we got a very clear photograph of him and we named him yeah. and put him out there and he was going to find a way to show me who was boss essentially yeah because yeah, it wasn't going to it wasn't going to improve his reputation mm. but but yeah. funny you should say that Geraldine Gilligan um John Gilligan's wife as well always used to you know all the stories that have been written about Gilligan over the years and and the two of them down in the equestrian center and you know he was his gang murdered Veronica Gearan. He was a drug dealer. He was everything. And she was living with him off the proceeds of crime and everything. But she was always very polite to me whenever she stopped and spoke to me and always did stop and speak to me. And, you know, was very pleasant. But she always used to say to me that she had a bone to pick with me. And I was going, oh, geez, what's this about? It's going to be a really big bone here. And it was that I had once said somewhere on a documentary that she rode horses bareback in Ballyfermot. <laughs> and she never rode a horse bareback in Ballyfermot. And I'm prepared to correct that, Geraldine. <laughs> she rode with a saddle on it. Right. But it didn't matter yeah. all the rest of yeah. it. That didn't bother her. It was just oh, that yeah, little yeah. detail. And it just shows, though, you have to be correct and right about absolutely do. as much as mm. you possibly can anyway. Um, you know, we are human beings too. Um, but anyway... So back to that beginning of that cold case and no long. One of the other things that he argued the bit about behind the scenes in the courtroom was he claimed that when the cold case detectives got going on his case, there was a big delay. And that was to do with a kind of HR issue within that serious crime review team, which has been played out, um, has been well played out. And he was trying to say basically that this sort of issue was happening within the unit and therefore his case was parked. So therefore he should be allowed away with murder. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, was, I mean, I think. The it, HR department had a cause that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you look for no long, I mean, the stakes were so high as a 72 year old man beginning a life 74. sentence. 74. 74. Yeah, yeah, he's going to probably die in prison. Yeah. I mean, he's he's been on bail, obviously, the whole time during the trial. Um as we said before, I mean, the average life sentence at this point in, in for people who, who get convicted of, of murder, it's something like 17 to 19 years. It changes all the time. So, I mean, you're looking at him. I mean, there's there's very rare that somebody in their 70s is first convicted of of given a life sentence and he would be in We're his 90s. 70, well, I would. 74 well, plus 19. <laughs> 74 plus 19 <laughs> is 93. So he would be, I mean, that's really the rest of his natural life one way or another. Huge stakes. And he obviously fought a tooth and nail, um, hoping to avoid that. And, you know, over the last few years, while always the chief suspect in this murder, no long um, became a carer for his own elderly mother, um, something that other members of his family were very upset about mm -hmm. and made a series of complaints about it. They felt that he had her basically under a coercive control. Um, she died in his care. And, um, you know, he's had set twos with neighbours. He has had rouse with members of his family. I mean, I think it's really important to see that. So he has a supporter in his partner who's been with him for 25 years. He's been living in her home with her. Um, look. There's somebody for everyone. There's someone for everyone, like, you know what I mean? But uh, his own actual immediate family absolutely do not support him and they would have done anything they could to help any investigation into any of his crimes They've never tried to cover up for him. They've no. never tried to make excuses for him. And they've been quite vocal about their concerns that he's been sort of free to do what he wishes. Um, but a really sinister character and... Um, Very. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot in his background there. I mean, it's funny, the, these guys that live a seemingly normal life in a very normal part of the, the world. Like yourself. <laughs> no, no, I don't think I seem <laughs> seem to live a normal life at all. But, when but uh, described himself now, well, sorry. But <laughs> he's, he's, he's like living in a kind of rural community, you know. No, it's oh, the city. Is a, is a city. It's just a little bit outside the city. It's like a suburb of the city. Yeah, mm. so he's living there. It's seemingly normal life in the middle of, of you know, an, an elderly suburbia. man. Suburbia. Um, just kind of... Uh, they're quite rare those types of people that are that are keeping up that pretense, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the the family 
gave a statement afterwards. She and family. She and family, um, you know, who are spoke about the kind of the the trauma of of a murder c- carries down through the, the generations and um, that it had been it had occupied their thoughts for 42 years as as you know as we said and what they mean I suppose by that is that they they you know that this has been on their mind for the whole time looking for justice and being aware that 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 this is what happened they spoke about their own father dying shortly afterwards and they said that no father should have to outlive or lose his or sorry, Mr. Uh, Nora Sheen's father dying shortly afterwards and saying the devastation it had caused him, the death of his daughter, and no father should have to lose a daughter mm-hmm. in that way. Um, and they spoke about seven grandchildren that Mrs. Miss, Miss, Mrs. Sheen never got to know. And um, obviously the sons were there. They're still, they said they lost a mother at a really young age mm-hmm. and the struggles that that brought them in their life. And that, you know, they've they've turned up in court, they gave evidence, um, or their statements are read anyway. Yeah. And, you know, just they to gave think, evidence, yeah. Yeah, James just to think. Evidence. And they spoke obviously about some of the, the, mo- the mother's eccentricities and things that had gone on, um, but they spoke about her as a loving, caring woman, um, you know, and, you know, it's it's... It it must have seemed through all those forty two years, or for a lot of those forty two years, that their their mother's killer would never have been brought to justice. And I suppose it's a it's a great day for the family today. Mm. It is. I mean, they in their you know the victim impact statement, they did also you know they said they wanted to take a moment to pray for the victims of sex mas- sexual assault and those who have lost their lives by homicide. You know, they were very. Um, they obviously they, they went through hell and back yeah. with this. I mean, I can only imagine the torture it's caused them for the last 42 years um and you know at the end of today's proceedings um the defense asked that um an application for legal aid to cover the legal team mm. be extended in event in the event that of the matter opinion. goes further so i assume yeah. that means maybe well, it's not over I yet think most people for who no. are convicted of murder because it's the most serious in the in, you know what I mean? it's the only it's the most serious charge that exists in this country a lot of them will try and find yeah. ways to appeal and you can see he's an agitator yeah you know what i mean he doesn't leave anything alone he's been used to getting away with everything all his life so he this would be an absolute um you know and and kind of like Grain Dwyer who's appealed again and yeah. again at all levels and, absolutely and Grain Dwyer it's is a known personality it's that kind of domineering and he's a known complainer to the media about people Calling him forty two instead of forty three or Rain whatever, Dwyer, yeah, yeah, yeah. He yes, something yeah, like that. Yeah. But Clodagh, when does he? When did he start to cry? You know, I like I was saying, I barely see much of a crack in him. Um, there was one day that he was there on his own without his partner, and he was in the cube of for the deli, and he was kind of laughing and joking. And I was like, okay, this is something now. This is a bit different. Um, and then when the jury left to consider the verdict after the final. Uh, you know, that the cases was arrested by both the prosecution and defence and the jury were walking off told, you know, this is it, that the, the judge was to give their his direction the next day. You could see him kind of for the first time actually looking at the jury, looking as almost as though he was kind of puppy eyes, trying yeah. to plead with them, like, look at me, I'm just an innocent man. And then today there was that sense of, you know, you could just see the sadness. And again, it's sadness for himself because he's mm. always gotten caught. And... After this, you know, he was the verdict of, of guilty. I, I seen tears. Rolling down his face. In his eyes. Right. Mm-hmm. In his eyes. Re- like, just sorry for himself. Yeah. And, you know, 74, but he's a burly, fit guy, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's not a kind of a frail pensioner, this no. guy. Oh, no. Far from it. Yeah. Like, he doesn't even, like we said before, he, d- he doesn't even look yeah. 74. And a, a kind of biker looking yeah. and dresses and still is into his, his her, I think he's in one of the clubs or certainly was in one of the clubs down in Cork. Mm. Um, so, yeah. You see. It's an incredible case, of course. One off my shit list for having to apologise. <laughs> there's loads more on it, by the way. <laughs> they, I won't name few. any of them yet. No, but, but they'll their all day will always circle come. around. <laughs> mm. But I mean, it's an incredible case and uh, it's obviously a case that's made possible by DNA testing. I mean, that is the core of why he's convicted. Um, and it's part of a whole stream of those types of cases across the world, in, mm. in the US in particular. Yeah. There's been loads of these cold cases now being solved by DNA being found, 
traces, um, DNA that was, or samples that were taken at the time, and that only through modern technology now can be used and tested. Um, in America, of course, there's been a few of them by, uh, it's all by Ancestry.com, hasn't yeah, there? Yeah, genealogy, mm. which yeah, is yeah. incredible. So I think... Those loves are serial killers. Y- yeah. Maybe not my serial <laughs> killers. <laughs> or maybe not, maybe not the actual <laughs> guys themselves, but... <laughs> <laughs> you love a good old serial killer. So, Just case. interested in, in yeah, yeah. how they're caught. Yeah, yeah. but the DNA you know? is is the thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, the DNA, and and I think we will see that more. You know, Absolutely. here as well, because routinely these samples were taken, even though they didn't know what they were going to be able to do with them. Mm. Obviously, the sperm sample in this case. You know, it was all those years ago that I don't think they ever conceived that there would be DNA testing, but there will be other cases like that. And obviously then there are these serial killers caught in America, haven't there been so guys many. that were never suspects at all? Mm-hmm. And, you know, a DNA test, all of a sudden this guy is picked out of nowhere and these cases are solved. So, yeah. So he's gone off to serve a life sentence and he'll probably go to Arbor Hill. Okay. He'd probably go to Arbor Hill, although that sometimes um, if he's he might be put in a prison that's that's close to where his family live. That that mm. would also be an Cork. option. It could be. It could be most unpopular prison in the whole system. Yeah, I mean, it depends if that you know he's he's a convicted murderer. It's obviously also a convicted uh, sex offender. So those prisoners, sex offend, offending prisoners, tend to be kept away from the normal yeah. population. So I don't know if Cork mm. would handle that prisoners do have a right to be sort of housed somewhere near their families if they so want. But Arbor Hill would be kind of one of the places and where he, he would cuffed? be protected. Not, no, no. The, just let out for the prison. kind of from the verdict, there was, obviously there was the verdict, guilty, and then they came back very quickly to do sentencing. And because, obviously it's straightforward, it's, it's life in prison, there was a victim impact statement ready. I was expecting that we'd have to go back. Because yeah. the courts were finished now, so October, I was like, that's it now, we'll be back in October for sentencing. But they did it so quickly, mm. because I assume, because, because of that break, because probably. of that break, and because everything's there, and we finished early in the day. Did he have whatever. a bag with him? He had a little backpack with him, but I think That's his overnight, that was yeah. just in case. Yeah, yeah he said that the that last That was just in case, days. it's gym jams and, and whatever, I haven't spare seen undies. him before. Um, You'd need a few of them though. Yeah, so he's a... Uh, yeah, and he'd be put in the geriatric sort of wing as well because there are like geriatric that. wings. But that's, they do keep prisoners. They'll assess are, him and they'll also have to check now. I mean, all lifers are put on suicide watch initially mm. because it's such a shock to the system. So he will be put on that even though a lot of them will spend the first months or even years of their sentence basically focused on an appeal if yeah. they're going to make that. And that kind of gets them through that same arrogance and agitation that got them through everything else. They believe that they're going to get this, you know, overturned. But there's very few. Well, a jury, I mean, the courts are reluctant to overturn the verdict of a, of a jury, a jury that has sat all through yeah. all those weeks, heard all that evidence. Mm. Um, they, the courts are reluctant because yeah. the jury has heard it and no case is perfect anyway, in, in the sense that, you know, people can pick out little bits of procedure that may or may not have gone wrong. But the courts do understand that a jury has given time and energy and, and mm. consider what's put before it. But of course, there are successful appeals, obviously, you know. Yeah. OK, well, we'll come back to it next week when we've had a few days to consider what it is that we actually, because we have we have lots of information on no long and we're going to sift through it. And um, yeah, we'll certainly write something in the Sunday World this weekend and then we'll come back next week and discuss a little bit more about this secret life of this man living as an ordinary um ordinary joe an ordinary joe in a suburb but actually a lot has gone on in the background so cloda your first trial first first role trial to sit yeah. on yet won't be the last no it won't <laughs> be the last and um yeah, you're going to be quizzed about this at every dinner party you go to, you know that? Well, I have my new trick, I told you. Yeah, I like that. Started, I like your style. I've started telling people I work in a shop when they ask me what I do for work. Well, that way you get no questions. Probably shouldn't put yourself on YouTube then, I <laughs> suppose. Well. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, yeah. Are you not your one for, No, yeah, you're not yeah, a criminal yeah, mastermind, <laughs> Claude. Just yeah, that's my twin. You can see I'm a twin. <laughs> I could say I have an evil twin. Mm, there well, you go. Yeah. <laughs> but you might have said you had a good twin would be the... Uh... <laughs> Right. Okay. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.